Forgiven, come on, sing healed and forgiven. Look where my chains are now. Death has no hold on me. Grace owns the ground. Come on, church, declare it one more time. Come on, healed and forgiven. Walking around these walls, I thought by now they'd fall. But you have never failed me yet. Waiting for change to come, knowing the battles won. For you have never failed me yet. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. And I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never failed me yet. I know the night won't last, 
and your word will come to pass. My heart will sing your praise again. Hey. Jesus, you're still enough. Keep me within your love, for my heart will sing your praise again. Come on. The promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. And I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never failed me yet. Never failed me yet. Just wave your hand at me. If you're waiting on something that you know the Lord promised you. Come on, just wave your hand at me. I know I'm not by myself. Sometimes it's just, it, it, it's rough. It's rough when you're in that waiting period. But I want these words, these next words we sing to encourage you. I want you to leave this place encouraged that the God who promised is able to fulfill every promise that he's made to you. And he's going to do it. Just encourage somebody next to you and say, he's going to do it. I've seen you move. You move the mountains. And I believe I'll see you do it again. You made a way when there was no way. And I believe. Come on, church, declare with me.
Your promise still stands. Amen. Great is your faithfulness. Faithfulness. And I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Yes, faith. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. Come on, sing it to him one more time. Come on. Your promise still Just stay right there, Jason. You never fail me yet. Never fail me yet. And you never will. You've never failed me yet. And you never will. You never will. Somebody needs to hear that today, that he's the God that always comes through. No matter where you are, no matter what you go through, never fails and he never will never will one more time church come on your promise I'm still in your hands this is my confidence you've never Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. God, we thank you for your mercy that knows no end. We thank you, God, that through the work of your son, Jesus, that you have removed our sins from us as far as the east is from the west, and that your word tells us that your faithfulness extends to the heavens. So, God, we give you praise and we give you thanks. We give you glory and we give you honor. We ask this morning as we continue to worship you that you would continue to be at work by your spirit, taking the truths that we sing and the truth of your word and impressing it deep into our minds and to our hearts, that you would shape us, that you would form us, that you would renew us, that you would revive us to walk according to your wisdom and your purposes and to reflect your son. We ask this for our good and for his glory. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Morning Fellowship, why don't you take this moment and opportunity to greet your neighbor. Well, good morning, everybody. How are we doing today? All right, good. That's good. That's good. Well, welcome uh, to Fellowship. So glad to have you. Uh, my name is uh, Claude Acho. I'm the uh, Outpost Pastor uh, for our Collierville Outpost, also part of our teaching team. Uh, wonderful to be with you this morning. Welcome to Fellowship. We're so glad to have you. At this time, I'm also going to invite those designated to take the offering to go ahead and come forward. Uh, if you're a guest, we would encourage you to just simply be a guest. Please feel no obligation to give. Uh, for those of you that, that call Fellowship home, thank you for your faithful giving. That allows us to, to do uh, the gospel work that we get to do uh, in, our, in our church and across our city and across our world. So thank you for your uh, generosity and faithfulness there. I'm going to share a couple of, uh, just really one announcement for us today, and we're going to continue to, uh, to worship Jesus uh, this morning. Uh, if, you're, if you're new, uh, today's your first time, or you're new-ish uh, to fellowship, we'd, we'd love to uh, uh, treat you uh, to guest lunch at the end of our worship gathering that'll be there uh, in the back. It'll be an opportunity for, for you to uh, meet some other new folks to the church, to meet uh, uh, some of our pastoral team and staff and some of our leaders, and just uh, ask some questions. We'd love to just get to know you and, and welcome you and say thank you for being with us today. So we'd love to have you uh, there for that. To join us uh, for guest lunch at the end of our worship uh, gathering. I'm going to go ahead and pray, and we're going to turn to God's Word, continuing our series uh, on the church, talking about uh, what does it mean to be the people of God together, uh, and what does that look like uh, in our place and in our time. So let's pray and ask for God's help uh, and guidance as we turn to His Word now. 
Father, we are grateful uh, that you have revealed yourself uh, to us. You have revealed yourself in a, in a marvelous and general way in creation, uh, but you have revealed yourself uh, in, a, in a true, special, and ultimate way through your word. And so we're grateful for your word. That leads us to the revelation of your son, Jesus, uh, who, it, who embodies uh, the fullness uh, of God. And so we ask, Lord, as we turn to your scripture this morning, that you would work by your spirit to put your son on full display for all to see. We ask that we would see Jesus uh, as he truly is in all his glory and all his wisdom and all his power and all his strength uh, and all his holiness, God, and that we would see him, we would trust in him, we would follow him, and we would be shaped by him as your people and then unleashed into your world for your kingdom purposes. So God, would, would you do that? Would you uh, humble us? Would you make us humble and contrite that we would tremble under the authority of your word, not seeking to master it, but to be mastered by it, God? Would you come and would you do that? Would you humble our hearts, give, our, give us attentive minds, give us open ears that we might hear from you this morning? We ask all of this in Jesus' perfect and powerful name. Amen. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. If you want to begin uh, flipping there or, or scrolling there, uh, let me set the table for us. We're, we're in the middle of our series uh, on, on the church. We're kind of uh, stopping in between long book series or topical series to, to kind of talk about just really fundamental theological things about what it is to, to be the church. And so last, uh, last week we talked about communion, uh, why, why we partake uh, in, this, in this practice that, of communion that Jesus instituted and how communion declares uh, the gospel through the elements of the bread and the cup, and, and, and then communion shows us who we are. Likewise, baptism two weeks ago uh, is this marker of entrance into the people of Jesus that, that we are showing that we are united to Jesus going under the water as he went into the grave for us and rising from the water just as, just as he rose from the, from the tomb uh, on our behalf. And so communion and baptism remind us as the church who we are. And then today we're talking about equipping. And if communion and baptism remind us who we are, equipping shows us as the church what we do, what we exist for, the sort of path on which we get to our destination is this idea of equipping. And so let's hear what this looks like, what this means from Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. The Apostle Paul is explaining to the church at Ephesus in the first three chapters, he has explained to the church at Ephesus who they are because of what Jesus has done. And now in chapters 4, 5, and 6, he's explaining them to them what they are to do because of who they are in Jesus. And here we see that the church is a family of ministers. Listen to this text. Verse 11. And he, Jesus, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. This is the word of the Lord. From the very beginning, God has been all about living in relationship and partnership with humanity. From the very beginning, when God created the first man and the first woman, he didn't create them and send them off to a faraway area to do his bidding, but he kept them close to him, to be in relationship, in partnership with him. This is Genesis 1. And in relationship and partnership with God, the first man and the first woman, the representative society of humanity, the first man and the first woman are invited into a relationship with God, but also a partnership that God called them to worship him, but also to partner with him in a mission, ruling, caring, and cultivating over God's creation. 
Genesis 128, he says to the first man and the first woman to be fruitful and multiply. And they do, and they name, and they rule, and they cultivate, and they protect. They're cultivating creation and culture. God, from the very beginning, has wanted humanity to exist in right relationship with him and in meaningful partnership alongside of him, reigning and ruling over his... Now, how did this go at the beginning? Not well. Great for a few verses, poor for the rest of the book. And what happened? The first man and the first woman invited into this divine relationship and this divine partnership where God says, I will be your God and you will be my partners ruling over creation, cultivating it. The first man and the first woman said, that's fine and good, but we have a better idea. Why don't we be our gods and you be our servant? And they flipped everything on its head. They dethroned God and exalted self. They rejected the ways of God for the ways of self. They pushed aside the wisdom of God and embraced and worshiped the wisdom of humanity. And what happened? Sin. That is the essence broken. But all throughout the story, God continues to enter in, to re-up, to renew that relationship and that partnership. Relationship of worship as his people and a mission to do his work in the world. And in a final consummating way, through Jesus Christ, God has re-upped his group project with humanity. And that new society of humanity that exists in right relationship with him through the grace of Jesus with a new mission is the church. That we don't just care for creation and cultivate it, though we do that, we have a new mission of making disciples of our Lord, of extending the kingdom so that all of the cosmos would see and know and bow and enjoy the reign of the King of kings and the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ, to the glory of God the Father. This is what the church is. The church is God's new mission and people, a new humanity among the brokenness of creation. And for us today, we're connecting all of that. It drills down to this idea of equipping, of being an equipping church. We hear it in the text that in verse 11, Paul tells us that Jesus gave to his church different gifts, different leaders, different offices, apostles, prophets, teachers, shepherds, evangelists, and he gave them to his church to do all the work. No. Verse 12, he gave them to his church to do what? To equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Jesus gave ministers to his church to create ministers of everyone, to all share in the work of God's new people, the church. This is a glorious cause for us. And if we don't understand this, we'll only conceive of church as a thing that we go to, an event that is held, and a thing we cut checks to. We'll miss out on the divine project that God is doing in this world at our time. So I have three things for us as we talk about the church being a place, a church of equipping, invited into the work of God in the world. One, we're doers of the work. We're talking about the goal of the work, and we're going to talk about the way of the work, really all under this big idea that Jesus has made his church a family of everyday ministers. Jesus has made his church a family of everyday ministers. John Stott, the famous uh, Anglican preacher and writer, once visited a church. Uh, he was from, from the UK. He once visited a church in Connecticut and, and got the bulletin on his way in and, and looked at it and, and was really shocked at what he saw. He saw on the first line, he saw the name of the pastor. On the second line, he saw the name of the assistant to the pastor. On the next line, he saw the name of the assistant to the assistant of the pastor. And then under that, he saw this line. And it said, ministers, colon, the whole congregation. And he said when he saw that, he was startled, but he was encouraged because it was thoroughly biblical. When we look at this text, notice in verse 11 and 12 that Jesus has given pastors, ministers, and leaders to his church to minister to the church, yes, to minister to everyone, yes, but also to minister to his church by equipping the church to be ministers among themselves. Jesus has given ministers to multiply ministers, the doers of the work of the church ministry, extending Jesus' kingdom throughout our lives, throughout our city, throughout our world. The doers of that work in the church is the church. 
all. Now, this is really different from the way we are trained, taught, and often experience what it is to be in the church. I remember seeing uh, Chris Tucker do stand-up uh, in Seattle. Rush Hour is one of my favorite movies of all time. I always try to weave that into one sermon, so check that off the bingo box for me. And I remember seeing him do stand-up in Seattle, and the stand-up was neither good nor funny, but this stood, uh, this stood out to me. He had a joke about growing up in church as a kid, and uh, the joke, which wasn't really funny at all, but what he described was this, was that uh, one time in service, the pastor was just kind of getting on the people and saying, y'all got to do this. We got to be about the Lord's work. Serve the Lord. Serve the Lord. Do this. And Chris Tucker was just like, you do the work. You're the pastor. You're getting paid. You got all the training. You got all the books. You do the work. You're up there. You do it. We're just over here. You do it. And is that not sometimes how church goes? That when you want to get involved, you want to find a way to contribute to the work of Jesus in the church body and church community, really there's only one thing for you to do. Take the trash out. Move this table. But the church is meant to be a family of ministers. The vision that Jesus has for his church is one where equipping is the DNA. Where equipping is the vibe, where equipping is the mood, where equipping pervades everything that we do because your leaders and your ministers here at Fellowship and in the New Testament church are meant to not do everything for you, but to minister to you and to minister to you by equipping you to minister to one another. Think about the leadership genius of Jesus Christ. Just think about this on a practical level. What is better? A few people do everything for the greatest cause in the world or everyone involved in the greatest cause of the world do everything? Do you see his wisdom? Are you awake? Do you see it? Do you see his wisdom? Do you see the glory of this? That God is undertaking a divine project of extending his kingdom full of power and grace in the world and he has not siphoned that off to a few clergy but he has opened that up to all of his sons and daughters. The church is a family of everyday ministers, doers of the work, all. Now, the reason some of you don't seem excited about this is because this is very demanding. Who likes demands put on them? I prefer the way of comfort. Think, think about this. Think about how this would work. Imagine you are on a cruise, and you have gone on this cruise really for one purpose, to eat to sleep, to drink, and then the most important purpose, to repeat. That's why you went on the cruise. Now, as you're being served at the cruise, the person bringing you your food and your drink or whatever, they give it to you, you say thank you, and then they say you're welcome, and then they say, hey, we have a mess in the kitchen, I'm going to need you to come help. Not, not going to work. Right? You're going to find a way to give a negative star review on Yelp. You're going to make a new path. That's not, that's not going to happen for you. It's not going to work for you. Why? Because you, you've come not for demands. You've come in order to be served. You've come in order to be comforted. I fear that the way the church has trained all of us is that we are been trained in order to approach the church as if it's a cruise where we come to be ministered to. The many come to be ministered to by the few, and that's sort of that. But clearly, Jesus has something different in mind. The church not as a cruise ship, but maybe more like a battleship where everyone has a place, everyone has a purpose, everyone has a task, whether they're very experienced or inexperienced, there's a place for them, there's a seat at the table, they engage in the work and we're all better off for it as we charge forward in the mission for transformation. This is what Jesus is calling us to, that everyone is a minister in his church by his redemptive grace, his creative genius, and by the power of his Holy Spirit. If everyone is a minister in Jesus' church, that only, not only sounds demanding, but that could also sound overbearing. We could take that as being instruction that we need to add more church events to our schedule. We need to find a way to stretch our already thin lives a little bit thinner. Right? We need to add more church to our, to our agenda. That, that is not uh, what, we, what we want you to do. I think what Jesus is calling us to, the way it gets fleshed out is if all people in his church are doers of the work, everyday ministers, then that ministry is to happen in the everyday of our ordinary lives. 
if all of us are everyday ministers building up the church, then that means that happens in our own spheres, in our own ways, according to our season of life, according to our capacity, according to our gifts, according to our experience. The whole church is everyday ministers in the everyday. Everyday ministry is speaking God's truth to your children. And they catch 9% of that conversation. But that 9% multiplied over 18 years, that's a lot of ministry. Everyday ministry looks like praying for your roommates so that you don't strangle them and they don't strangle you, right? When you, when you have this praying for them, praying for their salvation, encouraging them, building them up, displaying the Christian life before them. Everyday ministry is the way you carry yourself at your workplace. Maybe you're not able to, to speak freely about uh, your Lord and, and the good news of the gospel, but you can carry yourself in a certain way that reflects the way of Jesus. That's everyday ministry. Everyday ministry is how you act at the gym, how you carry yourself as a picture of the kingdom, how you reach out to those on your street. Everyday ministry happens in the what? Every day. This call for the church to all be ministers is not a burden, but a glorious privilege that happens as we live life. Everyday ministry is simply a life lived for Jesus. And I want you to think about the glory of this. I recently read something about uh, children, like uh, 8 to 14, the number one thing that is common among that age group for their dream job or profession. You know what it is? YouTube star. Views, notoriety, attention, prestige. Right? Think, think about this. When God renews all of creation and when this broken world fades away and the new heavens and earth meet, what will last? What will remain? What will shine for all to see, marvel, and enjoy for all ages? It's not our accolades. It's not the record books. It's not that thing that you hope you could achieve this week because it's going to make you look good to that person. It's not that thing. Do you know what will stand? The church will stand. The people of Jesus will stand. The renewed creation will stand. Everything done to glorify Jesus' name in this life will last for all life. That is glory. That is honor. This is God coming and, and, and approaching you and inviting you into his glorious work of redeeming all creation and saying, you are to be a part of this. You have a place in this. You are brought into the family business of kingdom work. All of God's church invited, called to be everyday ministers. This requires a flip switch in your thinking. And here's a flip switch. You need to understand that the day of your salvation was also the day of your ordination. You have been ordained into everyday gospel ministry. Jesus loved you so much, he didn't just save you and put you on the shelf like a collectible. He saved you and he said, get in the game, my son. Get in the game, daughter. Every day. Doers of the work. So if we're all doers of the work, what's the goal of the work? Well, it's simply there for us in the text. right there for us in a lot of ways in this text. Building up the church. This church is essential. Tell me if this bread that you see in your child's hand isn't essential. this work. The goal is spiritual unity, spiritual maturity, reflecting the fullness of Jesus. The stakes are high in this work because in this world, almost everything is stacked against growing into maturity in Jesus. Notice what Paul says in verse 14. He says that we can either be tossed like children to and fro by every wind of doctrine, by deceitful schemes, by human cunning, or verse 15, we can grow into all that is Jesus. These are the two things before us. The stakes are high here. 
And I want you to get a sense of the glory of this vision of what it means to build up one another in Jesus. Get a sense of this glory. Imagine if we go this route, building up the church. Imagine what happens when we give ourselves to this vision. Imagine this. Imagine every person in this room with an increase, a double increase of the fruit of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Imagine every person in this room doubly patient, doubled in their capacity to forgive, doubled in their ability to say the magical words that are impossible to say, I was wrong. Imagine everybody in this room doubled in their love for Jesus. Imagine everyone in this room doubled in their love and their excitement to be generous. Imagine every person in this room doubled in their holiness. Imagine every person in this room doubled in their zeal and love for God and neighbor. Can you imagine the ripple effects in our city? This is the goal of the work. The building up of the body to reflect Jesus. Can you imagine the legacies that would be changed if we give ourselves to this work? If we keep giving ourselves to this work? Could you imagine people's grandkids that are going to say, my great-grandmother, she was a pillar of faith, and this is how she helped my community and helped my parents. This is the vision and the glory of the work to which Jesus is calling us. Instead of being tossed to and fro by half-truths, we can grow into all that Jesus has called us to. And how does, this, how does this work happen? Well, the text tells us, look at verse 15. If the doers of the work are all, verse 12, if the, the goal of the work is building up the church, verses 12, 13, and 14, the way we do the work comes to us in verse 15 and 16. So verse 14 says we could be tossed to and fro in spiritual immaturity if we do not equip the body, if we don't give ourselves to this work. But if we do give ourselves to this work, here is how we do it. Here's how the church, the people of Jesus are built up into Jesus to reflect him more and more. Verse 15, here is the way of the work. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. From, the whole, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in what? In love. Here is the way we do the work of building up the church. Through the one, two sanctified punch of truth and love. Right there for us. Truth and love. This is the way we do the work of the ministry. Think about this. Love without truth, is fluff. And truth, without love, is harsh. But love with truth is transformational. You all know this. How many times has someone come to you and declared something absolutely, fundamentally, factually, and spiritually true, but did it in such a way that you left more hurt than helped? How many of you still carry those scars? How many of you conversely, you all know this, how many of you conversely have had people tell you exactly what you wanted to hear, love with no truth, and you would like to have a conversation with them now that the thing has gone down, and you would love to tell them and say, why did not you tell me what was really real? They gave you love without truth. But truth in love together is how the church is built up into Jesus. And truth for Ephesians, for Paul, is defined for us in chapter 1, verse 13, where he says, the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Truth builds up the church because truth is Jesus. Truth is what Jesus has done, what he will do. It is his life, his death, his resurrection, his kingdom, all of scripture pointing to him. That is truth. And that is how the church of Jesus is built up. The church of Jesus is built up when the people of Jesus speak the truth about Jesus to other people of Jesus. This is how we grow into the fullness of Christ. This is so critical because, again, think of the other option. Verse 14, tossed to and fro if the truth of Jesus and the love of Jesus are not building up the church. Paul says we can be tossed to and fro by false doctrine, by deceitful schemes, by human condition. In that time, there were false doctrines about Jesus' divinity that were false. There were false doctrines about Jesus' humanity that were false, trying to reconcile those truths in a way that, that was odd and, and erroneous and unbiblical. But in our time, we have those same problems, but, but we have more. Is it, is it not really hard to follow Jesus in our time? 
think, think about this. Think about the fundamental handicap that we carry within ourselves when it comes to following Jesus. H- have you realized how you have an incredible capacity to talk yourself into doing something that you know deep down is wrong? Have you, have you noticed that? That if we give you enough time, you could talk yourself into anything that you want. You could get a PowerPoint and show us through, through the reasons why you should do this thing that deep down you know, like, ah, that's not a great idea. We do, we do it in the trivial ways with, with getting that second serving or that, in my case, the fourth serving, right? We think about, the, I want a little bit more ice cream. I love to eat cereal as dessert, so I'll get two bowls. Well, I'll maybe go for a third and should I do that? No, I shouldn't do that, but three is less than five, so four is not that bad, so let me do that. And we'll just talk ourselves into anything. You know this. We laugh because it's universally true. We will find a way to talk ourselves into anything that we want. Why is that? Well, it's part of the human condition of sin. Not only is our rational capacity marred by sin, but the very things that we desire are marred by sin so that now we desire something that we know is sinful and we know is actually not helpful, but because we desire that wrong thing, we will now use our power of rationalization to justify that thing that we deep down know with our mind and our heart is actually not good nor godly. So if we don't have the church as everyday ministers around us speaking the truth of Jesus to correct those half-truths, we will stagnate and we will stall in spiritual immaturity. Do you have people around you who deposit the truth of Jesus in you that you are growing up into maturity in Jesus? This is how the church grows, through truth and through love. So we grow by speaking truth the truth of Jesus. Here is your task as everyday ministers, to have the truth of Jesus on your lips and to display the truth of Jesus with love on your hands, to love by displaying Jesus and to speak by pointing others to Jesus. Here is is your work in this. It's to pray for people. It's to encourage people. It's to preach the good news to them. It's to correct them when they're wayward. Truth in love It's to admonish. It's to say thank you. It's to say, how can I serve you? It's to say, how can I pray for you? It's to open your home in acts of love to see people flourish in the community of God's people. Truth in love is the way that the church is built up because the day of your salvation was the day of your ordination. And it's fitting that love is how the church is built because it was by love that the church was created. Think about this. What is it that happened to humanity, that happened to you and I, that has changed us from being enemies of God to forgiven friends invited into his kingdom work? What is it that flipped that script? What is it that shifted our destiny from God's verdict of condemned to the verdict of redeemed? What is it that flipped our desire from serving the kingdom of self to giving ourselves to the kingdom of Jesus? What is it that flipped our desire from serving ourselves to saying, how can I serve others to see them grow into Christ? What is it that has happened that has shifted that trajectory of this group of humanity known as the church? What is it? It's love. And how did this love come? Through Christ Jesus. Romans 5.8 tells us this, while we were still sinners, God showed his love for us in what? That Christ died for us. The cross is what creates the church because through the cross of Jesus, the love of Jesus has come among the people of Jesus who ran from Jesus but has now redeemed us and turned us around back to him. So we have a new identity and a new mission and a new posture. We're out of love for our Savior who loved the church into existence We love one another into maturity in him. Do you see it? This is what Jesus has invited us into. So here is what I want you to understand. That through the work of Jesus, you are first and foremost. The very thing that brought you into his family is the very same way you engage in the family business. Truth and love. Love on your lips Truth in your lips, truth in your hand, love in your hand. You are a minister in the body of Jesus, called by his grace, saved into his purpose. Doers of the work, all. Goal of the work, building up the church. The way of the work, truth in love, reflecting our Savior. Let's pray.
Father, we thank you that you have loved us. We thank you that you have given us grace. God, we thank you that despite the fact that in our moved our sins from us as far as the east is from the west, and you have called us into a new identity where we are forgiven and made new, and you've called us to a new mission to love and serve so that all the world might see and know you. God, in this work and in this task, we ask for your help. God, we ask for where we are engaging in this, would you encourage us to keep going? God, where we are slow in this, would you encourage us to get started? God, where we are wayward in this, will you direct us back into the right path that together in the context of community, we would work out and live out your family business. We pray this for our good. We pray this for the good of our city, God, that many would know you. And we pray this, Father, ultimately for your glory. It's in your son's perfect name that we pray. Amen. At this time, we have the opportunity to respond by receiving communion.